Hi, welcome to Mark Christ. Today I'm joined with the brilliant Dr. Bernard McGinn. Bernard is an American Catholic theologian, an historian, a scholar of spirituality, a specialist in medieval mysticism. Bernard is widely regarded as the preeminent scholar of mysticism in the Western Christian tradition. Perhaps he's best known for his comprehensive series on mysticism, The Presence of God. So just to begin then, Bernard, can you please tell us a bit about your background and some of the key events in your life that have helped to form you and your love for Christ? Okay, well, uh, I was born in 1937 in Yonkers, right outside New York City, and um, grew up in very Catholic, uh, American Irish Catholic uh, environment. And most of my education was uh, in the seminary, actually, uh, for, uh, for 12 years. And I was educated both in the seminary system in New York and then in Rome at the Gregorian University uh, for four years from 1959 to 63. So my, my interest in uh, theology and particularly mystical theology goes back a long way. I've been reading and thinking about the mystics in the context of theology since, uh, since the 19, uh, 1950s. Um, I first taught at Catholic University in, uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, but then uh, in 1969, I came to the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Myself and my colleague, David Tracy, were the first two Catholic scholars hired at the Divinity School, which was a traditionally uh, Protestant school up until that time. But post-Vatican II, of course, uh, many of the Protestant Divinity Schools in the US branched out and began uh, accepting Catholic students. And uh, so the Divinity School here wanted some Catholic uh, scholars on the faculty. So I spent my teaching career mostly at Chicago from 1969 to 2004, 2003, which is when I, uh, I retired. Uh, but I've kept uh, active uh, since then, both in terms of my writing, but then also in teaching, occasionally at the Divinity School, but then at other institutions for a semester or a quarter of Notre Dame, University of Southern California, um, and, and, and a number of different places. And uh, it was in the 1980s that I began thinking about the necessity of uh, having a uh, a complete, a synoptic history of mysticism from a theological perspective, because we didn't have anything like that, really, especially in English. So I planned what I thought was going to be originally three volumes. And as things happen, of course, uh, projects grow. And what was originally intended to be three volumes eventually wound up being nine volumes, the, la the last of which just got published this year, it came out in March. So this is a general history of Christian, Western Christian mysticism from the scriptural origins right down through uh, the year 1700. And you might ask why I stop in 1700. Well, 1700 represents the culmination of the condemnations of quietism uh, at the end of the 17th century, when certain kinds of mysticism uh, were condemned uh, both by uh, papal decrees and by uh, other uh, uh, ecclesiastical institutions. And, Maybe some of these condemnations were, were necessary, but not all of them. And the effect really was uh, not to totally destroy Christian mysticism, not a stop sign, as I put it, but a caesura, a kind of halt in mystical traditions for the 18th and 19th century when very little serious mystical literature was produced. And it wasn't until late in the 19th century and through the course of the 20th and now into the 21st century that I say we have a, a revival of Christian mysticism in a very uh, important way. So that's the gist of the long nine, nine volume history. I won't bore you with the, uh, the, the individual titles, but of course, as that history was developing, other projects came out that were connected with it. I see over your shoulder there, the book, Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism, which is an anthology I put together, you know, following the kind of model and view of mysticism that's explained in the longer volumes of the, of the presence of God. And um, there's been, as you know, not only in the US, but I think uh, around the world, a great revival of interest in mystical traditions in the last 30 or 40 years. Not, on, not only in Christian, Christianity, but also in Judaism and also in Islam. And I think in other traditions, I know something about the Jewish and, and Islamic sides here. And this is the great ecumenical opportunity, it seems to me, uh, in, uh, for all the faiths. And it also is an opportunity for the faith 
Christianity among them to rediscover the riches of the spiritual and mystical traditions, which had been kind of marginalized, to be fair, from 1700 on. And so when I grew up in the Catholicism of the 1940s and 1950s, you know, mystics were seen as kind of strange people, the odd birds. Yeah, we had them. There were some great mystical saints, but mysticism was not something, the mystical dimension of Catholicism was not for the ordinary believer. I think that's wrong. And I think that that's been overturned within the last few decades when many people have come to realize that not everyone is going to be a great mystic in the sense that a Teresa of Avila was or a John of the Cross or Bernard of Clairvaux. But the mystical dimension, the search for a deeper consciousness of God's presence in one's life is a part of every Christian's uh, vocation beginning from their baptism. So it's an integral part of, Christi uh, of Christian belief. And people will realize it in different ways. And of course, it's dependent upon divine grace anyhow as to how much the opportunity of a deep mystical life is going to be present, but that all Christians are called to be mystics in some way and in some fashion. And that's been a major motivation for my own work. And I think a major motivation for so many people that I meet, uh, you know, in my readers, but then also people that I meet through my teaching and that I meet through the various uh, uh, lectures and conferences that I've given uh, really all over the world, which is the other fascinating thing about it. I've talked, uh, given talks on mysticism in every continent except Antarctica. So this is a, this is a worldwide phenomenon. Yeah, wonderful, thank God. And um, as you said, there are these commonalities with other faiths and everything. Then on the other side of things, what are some of the distinctives of Christian mysticism and how it's played out as opposed to say the more dharmic spiritualities that people might be more familiar with from the east and so on well I'd start by saying all Christian mysticism is by definition trinitarian and christological in other words it's founded on our faith in God as a trinity of three persons and it's founded on our faith in the second person the trinity is becoming man in the incarnation and of course, that's, these are both distinctive to, uh, to Christianity. There may be things that <laughs> are reminiscent of them in some other traditions, but Trinitarian faith and Christological faith are, are distinctive. And that doesn't stop dialogue with other traditions which don't have a God who is Trinity or don't have a faith in an in incarnate uh, God as, as a redeemer, but it does speak to what's distinctive to Christian belief. And any kind of ecumenical discussion, I've been engaged in a lot of it, mostly with the Jewish scholars, but also with Islamic scholars to some, to some extent, needs to begin from the uh, honesty about what separates the traditions as much as what brings them together. And that's true ecumenical discussion, not you know, getting rid of the kinds of things that are distinctive. So that's the way in which I think current ecumenical discussion goes on. It doesn't try to say, well, we all believe the same thing. We don't all believe the same thing. But there are certain um, intentions that we have in common. There are certain patterns to the deeper practices of one's faith that also can be shared or at least look very similar across, uh, across traditions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that uh, the ecumenical side of the mystical revival is very, very important. Because uh, again, I look back on my own life now and there was very little ecumenism that was well known to the average person in the pew 50, 60 years ago. There were theologians who were engaged in ecumenical endeavors. But now I think the necessity for ecumenical outreach, for discussion with other faiths, for trying to understand other religious traditions, I think this is percolated down into almost all believers and has introduced us to a, a kind of situation which might be called, you know, uh, uh, a worldwide spirituality in the sense that all the different traditions recognize that we live in one world and we have to try to get along within this one world. There are opponents to this. All think of all the varieties of fundamentalism, both Christian and Islamic and Jewish and Buddhist and and Hindu, these are all over the world. Uh, 
that's the opponents, I think. Those, those are the opponents. Those who say, no, 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 only we have the truth. And we're not going to talk to anybody else. But the major, uh, if you will, counter to that is the ecumenical movement in all religious faiths that say, let's try to discuss. Let's try to understand. Let's try to get along. Let's try to work on common projects and emphasize what brings us together rather than what divides us. Yep, thank you for that, Bernard. And um, then just taking it back to your own life, are there any particular persons who've been especially inspirational or influential for you that you'd like to tell us about? Uh, well, a number of my teachers, when I studied in Rome, this was, as I said, 59 through 63, I had as my teacher the famous Canadian Jesuit Bernard Lonergan, who may, well, I think he's, uh, his name is still well known. I was very much influenced by Lonergan. I studied with him for several years. I, I wrote the papers for him. I became you know, a friend of his in, in that sense. And his particular way of approaching theology and philosophy uh, was very influential on my own, uh, on my own development. I'm not a <clears throat> Lonergan, <clears throat> Lonergan scholar in the sense that I write very much on him, but I have written on him. I've been active in some of the circles of Lonergan studies over the course of the last 40 or, or 50 years. So Bernard Blano was a great influence. Another great influence on my life was the um, uh, Benedictine scholar Jean Leclerc, whom I first met in 1966. I had been reading much of his work because I was very interested in medieval monasticism, especially the Cistercians on whom he was the great best scholar. And so from 1966 until his death in 1993, um, we, we became good friends. I read uh, and, pride, and also commented upon a number of his own writings and his approach to Christian spirituality, the history of monasticism, the Cistercians, et cetera, was uh, both an inspiration for me and then also a guide to my own, <clears throat> to my own scholarship. So there, there are other people, I think, but those, those were two people, I think, were, who greatly influenced me, two personal uh, friends as well. Obviously, I've read in a number of scholars of mysticism of the late 19th and 20th century who influenced my thinking. These weren't people who, whom I knew personally mm -hmm. and who stood out as kind of role models, if you will, for the kind of scholar uh, that I wanted to be. Yeah, thank you for sharing there, Bernard. And um, moving on then to some of your work, if we may, I'd love to ask you about that book that we see over my shoulder, The Essential Writings of Christian Mysticism. So here we have together writings from Origin of Alexandria in the third century to the work of 20th century mystics, such as Father Thomas Martin. Yep. So I want to ask, um, just as a general introduction, what's the importance of things like preparing for encountering God through biblical interpretation and prayer for those who would love to get started on this um, journey? Yeah. Uh, that book actually came to me by the publisher's uh, invitation because I was engaged in other projects, but the publisher Random House uh, asked me uh, oh, some years ago if I'd be interested in doing a, a kind of anthology on Christian mysticism. And I <clears throat> responded that I would be very happy to do that I wanted to create a, a synoptic anthology. That is not an anthology that proceeded just in chronological fashion, because my history, The Presence of God, proceeds in a largely chronological fashion. But I wanted to take my notion of mysticism laid out in The Presence of God and use that as the model for building a book, an anthology that would follow that idea of mysticism. And so the structure of the book is the structure of the kind of understanding of mysticism that I give in the, in the longer work. And what is that? Well, it's that mysticism or the mystical element concerns that aspect of Christian belief that deals with the preparation for the consciousness of and the effects of an immediate sense of God's presence in one's life. So see, it's structured according to preparation, to uh, consciousness, which is our sense of the of God being in some way immediately present to us, and then the effects that that has in the life of the person, the transformed person who has undergone this uh, consciousness, conscious experience, if you want to use the language of God, 
So the book is structured according to what do Christian teachers say about how you prepare your life in order to be able to receive the gift of the experience of God's presence. And this involves scriptural reading, it involves ascetical practice, it involves spiritual direction, a number of other things, a number of other aspects. And that was what the first part of that book consists of. And the second part then consists of, well, uh, how do the various mystics understand uh, the deeper consciousness of God that they come to? And that too has certain uh, distinctive features. It's often spoken of in terms of union with God, but it's spoken of also under the language of the vision of God. It's spoken of the, under the language of deification. In other words, mysticism includes the language of mystical union, but it goes outside of mystical union. And it also involves, of course, things like how do our own love and knowledge relate to a deeper consciousness of God's presence? What's the role of love? What's the role of knowledge? How do they interact, et cetera? So all these things are part of the, the, uh, the second category in that book, modes of understanding and presenting God's presence, God's immediate presence in our life. Then the last part, we'll deal with, well, what's the effect of this on the transformed person? And particularly, this is also, often involves the notion of the relationship of contemplation and action. That's an old and ancient theme in, in Christian uh, history. I mean, the language is taken over from Greek philosophy, contemplation and action. And there've been dif different models of how contemplative concentration on God should relate to apostolic action in one's life. So I, I trace the different models of that. And then also uh, another aspect of the effect of mysticism is what I call the issue of uh, you know uh, mystical heresy, if you will. Some mystics have made expressions and said that certain kinds of things that brings them into conflict with institutional aspects of the church. There's a long history of these conflicts and there've been condemnations of certain mystical tendencies. The last and most important of these is, uh, is the quietest controversy that I talked about, but that too is a part of the effect of, of mystical consciousness. So that's the structure of the book. There are, as I recall, 15 different sections. The sections are arranged chronologically, but the model is the synoptic one, if you will, a synthetic one of what I think the nature of mysticism is in terms of preparation, immediate consciousness and effect. Yeah, wonderful. And um, would you be able to recount any examples that you're particularly fond of and somebody who has uh, embodied this contemplation and action? So as I mentioned, the likes of Father Thomas Merton more recently, or who, who would be some of your favorites, if you want to call it that? Well, I, Merton, uh, my excerpts from Merton, particularly from his New Seas of Contemplation, uh, come in that section. I think New Seas of Contemplation is uh, perhaps Merton's central book about mysticism. Uh, but there are others, I think, that touch on that. But other models, for instance, go back and I, for instance, let's take someone like Gregory the Great, very good example of how to relate contemplation and action. Gregory's thought here is, is a different model. And I've called it an oscillation model because Gregory thinks that contemplation in a monastic sense is always going to withdraw you from society, but then you have to go back to society. So it's very difficult to combine them in one at the same time. You oscillate back and forth between contemplation and action. And he illustrates that actually by the example of Christ in the gospels, Christ goes up into the mountain to pray to the father. <clears throat> then he comes down in the morning to preach to the people. And that was the standard model. You'll find it in Gregory the Great, you'll find it in Bernard of Clairvaux. But by the end of the 13th century, beginning I think with Meister Eckhart is one of the first and his followers, Eckhart and others begin to see, well, maybe it'd be possible to combine contemplation in action. And maybe this oscillating bifurcated model is not the only one. And so Merton uh, says, uh, I'm sorry, Meister Eckhart here sets up a new pattern of the attempt to fuse contemplation and action in one and the same, uh, in one and the same person. And I think you'll find that, for instance, in Ignatius of Loyola, 
who was spoken of as a contemplative in action. And you also find it in a number of later uh, figures. I think Therese of Lisieux would be another very, very fine example. So these are some of the figures that are um, high, highlighted in that section. And people I take excerpts from to try to illustrate, there's not just one single Christian uh, motif about how you relate contemplation and action. It's varied over the course of the centuries. Just as when you talk about mystical union, there's not just one single model of mystical union in Christian mysticism, but there are a variety of models. Uh, some models uh, insist very much on the ongoing distinction between the divine and the human. There's a boundary you can never cross. Others think that you can arrive at some deep level of union, maybe not the only one, but some deep level of union in which the soul becomes indistinct from God. So these are two very different models. They often interact. And the indistinct union model is a lot more uh, controversial, let's put it, a lot more controversial than the union of two spirits that maintains the distinction. So the whole of Christian mysticism, as I've tried to put this in my long history and also in the, in the anthology, it's not just a single thing. It's not just one tradition. It's not just one or two mystics like Teresa of Avila and John of the Cross who are kind of, you know, the, these are the acne, these are the best people and you have to be like them. No, it's a symphony. I like Consors von Balthasar's uh, famous phrase, truth is symphonic. And the truth of the mystical tr tradition is symphonic. It's not just one instrument. It's a whole orchestra of different instruments playing together that make the uh, richness of the Christian spiritual and mystical tradition so attractive today, I think. Just try to listen to the symphony, not just to the horns or not just to the, <laughs> not just to the violins. <laughs> That's beautiful, Bernard. Thank you. And um, I think that really does come across in your work. I'd love to ask you now a little bit about the Presence of God series and um, the foundations of mysticism. So in that volume, you explore the origins of Christian mysticism, looking at the early Jewish apocalyptic writings, the pre-Christian Greek contemplative thought, the New Testament witnesses, early Greek patristic thought, and the contribution of early monastic practices. So I want to ask what are some of the central moments and trends which most captivated you from that period? Well, uh, it, I'll let me talk a little bit about that volume. My, my model about the history of Christian mysticism has been a kind of a threefold model. I talk about three interactive layers historically. The first layer, the foundation layer, is uh, what, I, what we can call by and large monastic mysticism. And it begins in a very formal way with the origin of Alexandria and, and, and others in the late second and the third century. And Origen was not himself a monastic, but he was kind of the father of monastic spirituality and mysticism. And so the main uh, people who carry on that tradition are monks of both East and West. And that's the main Christian mystical tradition down to the 12th century. It's not that the monastics said only they were mystics. They believed that mysticism was possible if, to any uh, believer. But the people who wrote about mysticism and encouraged mysticism in the monastic level from the second, third century down to the 12th century were primarily monastic. Then in the 13th century, what I call the new mysticism emerges. I'm talking here primarily, remember, about Western Christianity. And in the new mysticism, new models of, of, monastic, of, of mystical consciousness and new religious groups, the mendicants, for example, the beggings, for example, an increasing number of, uh, of lay people, these become major centers for mystical thinking. And I think that new mysticism from the beginning of the 13th century percolates down to the 16th and 17th century when a third layer, what I call the crisis of mysticism emerges. Uh, and that starts in the 16th century, but it's particularly pronounced in the 17th century when the, the conflicts between institutional, the institutional church and certain mystical tendencies uh, become increasingly uh, uh, vibrant and strong and eventually result in quietest, uh, quietest condemnations. So I, I began my project thinking I could write about the monastic layer in one volume, 
But I realized as I was working on it that I'd have to split it into two volumes. It was just too much material. And so the first volume became primarily what today we call patristic mysticism. Uh, beginning, I start with the scriptures because that's the necessary foundation. And of course, the background to the scriptures, which are Jewish apocalyptic thought. But then the background to the patristic thinkers are, is primarily certain amounts, certain aspects of Greek philosophical thought. They're not Greek philosophers, but they use Greek philosophy in the service of Christian faith. And Clement of Alexandria and Origen are, are primary examples here. And that gets carried on in East and West, the Cappadocian Fathers in the East and Pseudo Dionysius uh, also in the East and the Western Fathers of the fourth and fifth century, people like Ambrose and Augustine and Cassian, which culminates then in Gregory the Great at the end of the sixth and the early part of the seventh century. So that's the patristic, if you will, patristic monastic foundation of, uh, uh, and that's why the name of that volume is Foundations. And <clears throat> if you know, I make, make one other, let me just get a little sip of water. Originally, I thought of writing uh, equally about both Eastern Christian mysticism of orthodoxy and Western Christian mysticism. But I realized that that was too large a task. And also, uh, the early uh, dimensions there are, are written in Greek, the Greek fathers. But then when you proceed to the modern period, at, but then even in the patristic period, you have the great contribution of Syriac Christianity. And I don't read Syria. And then when you proceed in the modern period, you have the great contributions of, of Russian uh, uh, Orthodox uh, mysticism. And I'm innocent also of, uh, of Russian and old church Slavonic in those languages. So I decided what I would do would be to emphasize those aspects of Eastern Christian mysticism, Orthodox mysticism that became known and influential in the West. And this was part of the Western story, but I had to leave to somebody else who had the necessary linguistic and historical backgrounds to give the full story of Eastern Christian mysticism because it involves languages which I don't really master. And I believe for this history, one needs to know the languages, the texts themselves in their original language. So I, I do deal with Greek patristic authors, people like, especially Pseudo Dionysius, but also Gregory of Nyssa, and various others because they were translated and they were available and they were formative for Western mysticism. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't necessarily deal, deal with other, other figures. So that's the, that's the first volume, Foundations of Mysticism. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Bernard. And um, somebody that you do discuss is St. Augustine, who unfortunately it seems to me um, has become something of a weapon way for what's gone wrong in the church. And I wanted to ask you, why is that too simplistic? And what are some of his great contributions? Oh, I don't think you can do the history of theology, let alone the history of mystical theology without Augustine of Hippo. And this is not to say that everything that Augustine said is, is correct or that all of Augustine's influence has, has been, uh, you know, just wonderful. <laughs> Augustine has, has flaws uh, just, as, just as many others do. But that Augustine becomes a kind of, you know, ogre sitting in the past is really a great historical era. And I won't name the people who do that, but there are people who write on mysticism, you know, Augustine is really bad. Meister Eckhart is really good. Uh, <laughs> that's nonsense. Because like anything else, Augustine is a tremendously influential figure, very important and formative for the tradition. You cannot understand the later mystical tradition, let alone the later theological tradition, unless you know Augustine. Someone once said, you know, much of, much of Western Christian later theology is a series of arguments over Augustine, <laughs> over which Augustine you want to really follow. So Augustine and his, Augustine's mysticism is, is crucial, I think, for understanding the later, later tradition. We don't approve of everything that Augustine did and said, uh, obviously, today, and they're very many, many things about, for instance, an example uh, that could be, uh, well, that just take religious persecution. I mean, Augustine decides, I think wrongly, <laughs> eventually that, you know, the Orthodox faith 
has not only the right, but the obligation to persecute uh, heresy. I think that's a, that's a large mistake. It's a misunderstanding, if you will, of the gospel message. Uh, but Augustine's thought about the role of Christ. Augustine's thought about the ascent of the soul. Augustine's thought about the universality of mysticism also. These are crucial. For example, you know, Augustine's um, great, greatest mystical writings come in his commentaries on the Psalms. Most people think of the confessions, and that's important. We have to read his long commentaries on, on the Psalms, and these were preached. These were homilies preached to his, communi to his community of farmers and, and town dwellers in his diocese of Hippo. They weren't given just to monks. He had a monastic community, but he preached a mystical understanding of the Psalms to all Christians in his churches over the course of 30 years. And these were the things that were collected. And if you really want to get Augustine's uh, mysticism, you have to read that very long, very, very long number of homilies on, on the Psalms. Uh, so Augustine is a, is a crucial figure. And although he was a monastic and a great ascetic, he was also a bishop. And he was a pastoral figure. And his homilies on the Psalms preached to these to his community show that he thought that all Christians should have a, a mystical understanding of, of the scriptures, the Psalms and the other things, the song of uh, the other things that they were reading, the Gospel of John, for example. Also, his homilies on the Gospel of John would be another example. So he's a crucial figure. Excellent. Thank you, Bernard. And, you know, another example, if I could, Bernard of Clairvaux is so important a figure for me and uh, one of the great mystical teachers, certainly in the church. But that doesn't mean that I approve everything that Bernard of Clairvaux did. I don't approve of his preaching the crusade. I think that was a great error, and he himself was very ambivalent about it at, at later time. I don't approve of his theological conflict with Abelard. I think there was much more of a misunderstanding that went on there. And he was in many ways unfair to, to Abelard, if you read that whole history. But that doesn't preclude the fact that his sermons on the Song of Songs, his treatise on loving God, De Legendo Deo, are essential texts for, for mystical understanding and have been greatly influential in the course of, of history. Yeah, wonderful. And um, that's something you look at in the growth of mysticism, building on the foundations. You cover that period 500 to 1200. Look yep. at some of those major figures, Gregory the Great, Aragena, Bernard of Clairvaux, as you mentioned, William of St. Thierry, Hugh of St. Victor. I want to ask um, what are some of the major emphases amongst, amongst some of those figures? And um, what do you find most moving in their, any of their writings? Well, in, in the section on the 12th century, I won't go into the early period. I think, for instance, John Scotus Seriusian is a very important figure in the history of, uh, of, of Western mysticism because he injects the pseudo-Dionysian apophatic mysticism into the, Western, uh, into the Western canon, if you will. But if we take just the 12th century, which is such a great period because of the great Cistercian mystics, you have the great Victorine mystics, you have people like Hildegard of Bingen, uh, Benedict and Abbas, even Joachim of, of Fiore, the 12th century is one of the great eras of mysticism. And uh, I think one of the fundamental characteristics of the 12th century, and I say this, excuse me, in that volume, is the ordering of love, the ordo caritatis. And this goes back to a text from the Song of Songs. Which in which the bride says to the, about the bridegroom, may he order charity in me, may he put charity in order, ordinavit in me uh, caritatem. What does it mean to order love? That was a central feature, both for the Cistercians and also in its way for the Victorines and others. And it was part of how you put together love and knowledge and the relationship of love and knowledge in the path to God and the ascent to God. Christian mysticism, by definition, says that God is reached by love and not directly by human knowing, ratio, reason. Human reason is never going to stretch to God, but love empowered by grace can attain God. And that's part of the ordering of love, that you order love in its relationship to human knowing and then to the higher kind of knowing that is a part of the grace that God is going to give to the mystic. And that higher knowing is um, not expressed by the word ratio, reason, 
It's expressed by terms like intelligentsia, understanding, or maybe intuition would be ways of describing that. That, in other words, there's a higher dimension to knowing that comes from loving God. And that higher dimension of knowing is a kind of direct contact with God that you find in intelligentsia. It goes beyond ratio. It goes beyond what we can do on the basis of our own, re uh, of our own reasoning. So um, another phrase that really goes together with the ordering of love is the phrase that you find in William of saint -Thierry, in Bernard Clairvaux, and various others. It goes back to Gregory the Great. The phrase in Latin is amor ipse intelligentia est. Love itself, amor ipse, is a form of understanding, intelligentia est. So love grants an understanding, but it's not the understanding of reason. It's an understanding of a higher dimension, an understanding of a direct knowing of God. That's why some would translate it as, as intuition. Now that's one of uh, those complex of themes, the relationship of love and knowledge, the fact of intelligentsia and love being a form of intelligentsia understanding. These I think are among the central motifs in, uh, in the 12th century. There are many, many others, but I seize on those as a kind of, uh, if you will, door that opens up into the riches of 12th century mysticism and uh, in that sense, an access. That's wonderful. And so, uh, something that I think is really important in your work too, because it seems to me, my, for a long time, I went to the Orthodox Church in London and a lot of Orthodox people now online have this very strict dichotomy as if it, in the East, it was all about mystery and they preserved um, the mystery of God and the West became too overly rationalistic. And uh, I think you're pre presenting a much more complex and interesting picture from history. And um, in line with that, then I'd love to ask you about the flowering of mysticism and um, the men and women in the new mysticism. And how, how did the say 1200 mark a turning point in the history of Christian mysticism? No, well, let me start by saying a little bit about East and East and West. Um, because I think that's often misunderstood I, on both sides, I would say. Mm -hmm. A critique that many Orthodox theologians offer about the narrowness and rationalism of, of Western theology and Western mysticism, I think is truer of later periods. In the 14th and 15th century in the Christian West, there's a kind of a separation, or at least a separation begins between theology, which is increasingly a kind of school exercise, and spirituality, which is a much, spirituality and mysticism, much deeper engagement of the believer. And that split between theology and spirituality and mysticism is a fact of Western history, at least from the 14th century on. And it's only in the 20th century that we've begun to overcome that. All the great theologians of the 20th, Catholic theologians of the 20th century, Bernard Lonergan, Karl Rahner, Hans Urs von Balthasar, and others recognized that split had happened historically, but it was very bad. It was very dangerous. And so when Eastern Orthodox criticize sometimes a narrow rationalism of the West, they may be true, but it's true of these later periods. It's not true of the 12th century. It's not true of the earlier centuries. It's not even true of the great mystics of the 13th century, <clears throat> like Bonaventure or Meister Eckhart, who were great theologians, but also great mystical and, 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 spiritual, and spiritual teachers. Uh, and so that means that many of the themes that the Orthodox emphasize quite rightly um, were also true of the West. Take the theme of deification. You'll sometimes hear it said, oh, deification, that's, that's an Orthodox uh, uh, you know, Christian uh, idea. And God, God bless the Orthodox because they've always stressed the importance, the centrality, not just the importance, but the centrality of deification. But all the Western mystics also talked about deification. Augustine talks about deification. Uh, John Scotus Eriugen talks about deification. 12th century, uh, mystics like the Cistercians, Bernard of Clairvaux, talk about deification, as does Bonaventure and Meister Eckhart and later thinkers. So deification is not absent in any way from Western Christian mysticism. So uh, to get to the issue of, of the flowering itself and what the new mysticism is that I talk about so much 
Well, I was struck by a certain shift that takes place very close to uh, just about the year uh, 1200 in that sense. And an ideal figure here would be Francis of Assisi, who I think is a great mystic, but also a great theologian in his own way, but he was not an educated person. And he was not a monastic who took off a monastic life and uh, went into the cloister to devote himself to a life of contemplation. He was a mendicant. He was out preaching in the world. He was giving the example of, of poverty and uh, humility and, and obedience through his actions as much as through his words. But when his words are there, you'll see they have a deep kind of theological and even a mystical kind of uh, sense to them. And the contemporary Beguines, who uh, were active at the same time when Francis was undergoing his conversion shortly after the year 1200, they didn't, they were women, small groups of women living in community, but not under a specific rule, living in the, when the, in the parish communities themselves, practicing uh, a deep spiritual, if you will, mystical life, but also engaged in apostolic activity like Francis taking care of lepers and the sick, et cetera. So the, the Beguines and the early Franciscans, the Fraternitas, Francis and his brethren, are a new model. They're a model of engagement with the world that the enclosed monastics did not have in the same way. This I talk about as the secularization of mysticism. It's not, it's moving out into the world rather than staying behind the walls of the monastery. And it also is appealing to new groups of people. Democratization is another word that I've used. That is, they're appealing to not only to the poor and the artisans, but they're frequently appealing very directly to people of both sexes, both men and women. So there are mystical women prior to 1200. Think of Hildegard of Bingen. But the great flowering of mystical women begins about the year 1200. And in the 13th and 14th century, you have numbers of mystical women, uh, some in lay groups, others in traditional orders, but many in the, the, the mendicant women of both the Franciscan and the, uh, and the Dominican orders. And the Beguines, who are kind of, you know, a tertium quid, a third uh, a possibility. So that plus the move into the vernacular languages. Almost all mysticism prior to 1200 was expressed in the learned language of Latin by, and, you know, by trained monastics, mostly men, but occasionally women like, uh, like Hildegard. But when mysticism moves out into the world, it has to engage people who don't know Latin and who don't have education in mon monastic schools or even in the new universities. So it moves into the vernacular and we have the growth of the vernacularization of mysticism in the 13th and in the 14th century and, and, and on. And with that move into the vernacular, you also get new kinds of mystical themes that are created to speak to these new audiences new ways of understanding mystical union, new ways of expressing the soul's love for God, frequently what you, know, you can call kind of excessive love language, which you find in the early Beguines and in some various others. So all these things put together indicate what I talk about as the new mysticism, a new chapter in the history of mysticism that begins just a, almost exactly around the year 1200 or so it becomes evident. This doesn't mean that the, the monastic tradition dies out. It doesn't. It continues on, both in a number of important mystics that come out of monasticism, but also in the interaction between the monastic tradition of mysticism and these ideas of the new mysticism. And it's that interaction that enriches Christian mysticism in the later, in the course of the later uh, Middle Ages. And what makes it such a complex phenomenon because you can no longer do it just through the Latin language. You have to do it through German, you have to do it through French, you have to do it through Italian, you have to do it especially through the, uh, the, the uh, you know, middle, middle Dutch or middle Net Netherlandish, et cetera. And then later on also through Spanish, the Spanish language dimension comes in somewhat later. So it was very, very complex. 
And that's what I investigate both in the varieties, uh, the flowering of mysticism. And then in the fourth one, I'm concentrating on the harvest of mysticism in medieval Germany, because the German side of this is so important. And then finally, in what I call the varieties of mystical theology, where I try to look at the other dimensions, English, the great age of English mysticism in the 14th century and into the 15th century, and great vernacular Italian mysticisms, and then especially the mysticism of the low countries, Rusbrook, Rusbrook's followers, and the few mystics who had prepared for Rusbrook, like the great Begin Hagi. So that, that's really the picture of, of volumes three, four, and five, in a sense all of which try to deal with this very rich period from 1200 through to about 50, about 1600. I mean, you know, we can't do exact chronologies here, but that's the rough uh, chronological limits. Yeah, magnificent. And um, I think what, what something you just said there about secularization shows the importance of the um, coming to grips with history and going beyond our more modern social constructs, because whenever we obviously think of secularization, we think of the world becoming less religious. Yeah, which is right, yeah, less religious. Category. And uh, I think your work is really helpful in um, that respect. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, what I mean is good secularization in the sense that they go out into the seculum in Latin, that is into the secular world, and try to convert it. Yeah. Rather than, you know, rather than taking out religion, they try to inject religion into the seculum, into the world. Magnificent, thank you, Bernard. And um, just about that, the harvest of uh, mysticism, I want to ask you about Sir Thomas Aquinas, because he is somebody who, like I mentioned before, a lot of Orthodox people are very uncomfortable with, and it, it's often this kind of, I suppose, a crude contrast between St. Gregory Palamas on one side and Thomas Aquinas on the other. I want to ask you about um, Aquinas and why he became such a stalwart for the West, and I suppose you'll probably say this anyway in line with that why did um his works become so um abused with the kind of manualist tradition and things like that that makes sense well the history of thomism is a very long and complex and i did a little <laughs> book on um, on thomas's summa theologiae a, a few years ago which is a kind of biography it's part of a series called biographies of, of religious classics uh to try to show first how thomas became a classic and then also how he's often been misunderstood, especially in the more modern period in, in neo-scholasticism as, as it's called. I would not call Thomas Aquinas a, a mystic in the same sense that I would certain other figures. He never wrote a mystical work as such, the way his contemporary Bonaventure did and things like the mind's journey into God and, and various other things. Mm -hmm. Thomas Aquinas wrote doctrinal theology, Sacra Doctrina, but as a part of the doctrinal basis for all Christian belief, of course, Thomas had to touch on many mystical themes. So his discussions of the nature of contemplation, his discussion of the relation of contemplation and action, his discussion of the role of ecstasy and rapture and parts of his theology of grace. These are all you know, essential doctrinal foundations for, for mystical theology and including his doctrine of God very influenced by pseudo Dionysius, you could say is a very uh, significant doctrinal foundation or base for mystical theology. I'm not talking about Thomas's individual life. I mean, we have stories about him in the lives that indicate he had a deep prayer life and that he might have experienced various moments of mystical consciousness, certainly. But he doesn't write about these. He's not a mystical author in the sense that a Meister Eckhart or a, or a Bonaventure or others would be. So in that sense, I think uh, in the Harvest of Mysticism, I do talk a little bit about how uh, aspects of Thomas's Sacra Doctrina are important for understanding the uh, speculative mysticism, the deeply speculative mysticism, people like Eckhart and the, uh, and the German and the German Dominicans. But I don't have a huge chapter devoted to Thomas Aquinas because from the perspective of someone talking out of his mystical consciousness and trying to encourage others, Thomas doesn't do that. I do think though, as that little book on, on the Summa goes on to show that the modern revival of Thomas Aquinas that we talk about as neo-scholasticism, which after all was only powerful for less than a century, you know, from about 1870, you might say, to 1960, to put uh, crude dates on it, 
In many ways, that was a kind of misunderstanding of Thomas Aquinas. I think we can see that now as we read back into ne neo-scholasticism. You know, it was laudable in its intention. It was to bring the riches of Thomas's thought to the fore, but it was also highly polemical. Thomas was the answer to modern philosophy, which was all bad. So let's go back to Thomas Aquinas. And it was misunderstanding Thomas because it's frequently looking at him only from a philosophical perspective, not from a doctrinal perspective. Thomas did philosophy, but he was primarily a doctrinal theologian. He needed to do some philosophy in order to show the relationship and importance of philosophy to doctrine, but he wasn't a philosopher. And so Thomistic philosophy is a kind of odd bird in, in a certain sense. It, uh, it, it's, a, it's in many ways a kind of misreading of, uh, of Thomas Aquinas. There may be a philosophy there, but he never wrote it. He never wrote a philosophy. Well, I mean, his De Ante, in a sense, the early treatise, was a kind of mystical, a kind of philosophical uh, introductory book for students. But he never sat down to write his philosophy out. He didn't do that. He commented on Aristotle, sure. But he wrote theology. He wrote a Summa Contra Gentiles. He wrote a Summa Theologiae. He wrote scriptural commentaries, endless scriptural commentaries. That's what he did for a living, if you will. So <laughs> neo-scholasticism, neo uh, I mean, it had some great thinkers and it had important insights. But on the whole, I think it was a misreading that is now faded. We have discovered much more about the true Thomas Aquinas post-Vatican II and the collapse of neo-scholasticism. Yeah, thank you. So this is one, that the last 50 years have been one of the great ages of, of uh, Thomas studies. Uh, incredible, uh, great riches of, of Thomas studies have gone on all, all, all over the world, but largely these were made possible by kind of saying, well, neo-Thomism was a mistake. That's how I would put it. Thanks for that, Bernard. And uh, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're sort of hitting an hour, but um, just before we go, then I would love to ask you, is there anything else um, that you're working on at the moment or that you still feel a passion to get involved with you'd like to tell us about? Uh, let me just take another sip here. Well, when I, uh, my original intention was to carry the story of mysticism down to the 21st century. When I finished volume nine, The Crisis of Mysticism, which the one that just came out in, in this March, as I was finishing it, I realized that to tell the full story of, from 1700 down to the present would probably demand another two large books. And my thought was that at my age, uh, almost 84, this would be an unwise thing to do because it would take a number of years of work and it would be harder to do today. As you know, the libraries have been shut down all over uh, in the United States for over a year now. They may gradually reopen this year. And, but the kind of research that I would need to do for this book would demand intensive library work, which, is, which was kind of impossible And when I looked at this you know, a, year, a year ago or so. So I decided, given the importance of, the, of quietism and, and finishing this off, that that would mark the end of the long history of the presence of God. And if others wanted to carry on an in-depth study, that would be wonderful, but it wasn't going to be me. But as I thought about that, I've decided uh, in the course of the last six months or so, I've been planning to do what I call a brief book that would be an introduction to some modern mystics. By modern, I mean people from about 1850 down to the present. It would not attempt to be kind of in-depth history, the way the Presence of God series tried to be, whether it was or not. But it would be my personal selection of some mystics, maybe 18 to 20, who have influenced me and whom I find particularly rewarding. And it wouldn't necessarily be a full scholarly study of each of them with the intensive you know, footnotes, et cetera. It would be much more of an introduction for the general, for the general reader. And I might not even use many footnotes, but I would, of course, include bibliographies for people who are interested. So who would I do? Of course, I would do figures like uh, Charles de Foucault and Therese of Rousseau, Elizabeth of the Trinity, Pierre Théard de Chardin. I would probably, I'm going to probably do Thomas Merton. I would do some uh, figures that uh, are the kind of modern mystics who push the envelope, Simon Weil, 
you know, was never, never wanted to be baptized, but there's a deep mysticism uh, present in her works. Uh, figures like Doug Hammarskjöld, I think, who uh, was a great, uh, I mean, his markings is a very powerful mystical, uh, a mystical text. So when I circulated the list to my uh, friends who are interested in mysticism about the figures I was thinking of doing, because everybody says, oh, but you should do so-and-so. <laughs> and, and I say to them, well, I just can't do everybody. <laughs> and it'll be extremely difficult to make certain kinds of decisions. So I'm going to make it clear as, as I write this book, which I'm starting on now, this is kind of personal choice, my, my personal choice. I also want to include some figures from the arts and from, and from literature, who I think have very important mystical, uh, mystical dimensions, poets, artists, musicians, etc. cetera. Um, so I'm working on that, on that book and I'm reading a lot. I knew a number of these modern figures, but I'm reading some people that I had long uh, thought about, but I've never really studied. And I'm finding wonderful, uh, wonderful riches there. Elizabeth Trinity is an example. I had a number of her books, but I had never read them. Or um, Henry Lassois, uh, um, Abhi, uh, is, is, I'm trying to think of what his Hindu name is, um, Abish Katikananda, the French priest who went to uh, India and uh, deeply absorbed Hindu traditions and was trying to create a bridge between uh, Hindu mysticism, non-dual uh, non Advaitin mysticism, Christian mysticism. Again, I knew of him, but I had not read him. So I've now read three of his works and I'm finding him extremely fascinating. I certainly want to in include him as well. So it's been a learning experience and I would hope I could finish a book like this in a you know, relatively short, uh, short period of time, a year, a year or so. But I felt that I couldn't commit at this age in life to a number of more years, six or more years of writing very extensive, large volumes. So that's where I am with my my project on some modern mystics, a personal selection is what this book is tentatively called. That's wonderful. I really look forward to it. And um, thank you so much for your time today, Bernard. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Well, thank you, Mark. I mean, I love to talk about these uh, issues that, uh, I mean, I love to talk about the great mystics who continue to inspire me and energize me in my, in, in my old age. And so I'm, I'm happy to do this. And thanks for the opportunity. Amazing.